morning session uh, of this year's special COVID edition of Cornish University. Um, the guest that we have this morning has done extensive work, as we know, at Crystal Palace, Arsenal and Celtic. Um, so I'd like to welcome you. Oh no, that's the wrong Ian Wright. Sorry. Ian Wright is a computer scientist, uh, an economist who blogs at darkmarxism.net and must be fed up of football related jokes about his name. Um, all of the links will be available um, on the chat column. Um, and I would like to introduce Ian to talk about Marx as um, capital as a real god. Okay, so Ian's going to talk for about 45 minutes to an hour and then we'll have plenty of opportunity for comrades to ask questions, intervene, um, you know the drill, uh, we'll recap on how to do that when you are made participants in the session after Ian's talk. Okay, thank you, let's go. Uh, thank you, uh, good morning everyone, uh, glad you could all make it. Also thanks to the organizers of the Communist University uh, for inviting to, uh, me to give a talk today. So today, I want to talk about some core aspects of Marx's theory of capitalist society, particularly some of his views of, of what capital really is and how we should best understand it. And that means I'm going to tread over some familiar ground, um, particularly Marx's theory of value. And so I'm going to indulge in a small amount of Marxology and make some claims about what I think uh, Marx really meant. So that should be fun. Um, but what I hope is that the familiar will become somewhat unfamiliar again. And what I'm gonna say will contain some novelty because there is a specific aspect of Marx's theory of capitalism that I believe isn't fully uh, sufficiently emphasized. And that is Marx's view that capital is an actual entity, a being with a mind of its own that operates independently from us. And of course, when stated plainly like that, the proposition seems absurd. How can a large sum of money that is used to make a profit have a mind of its own? That doesn't seem to make any sense at all. But my aim here is to explain precisely why this proposition is not absurd, but in fact, articulates the essential nature of capital and the viewing capital as an entity is necessary to fully understand the social reality that we find ourselves in. So I hope I've piqued your interest. And with that, um, let's begin. So <clears throat> Marx viewed capitalism as a semi-conscious social formation in the thrall of objective economic laws that no one really controls. And Marx, as I'm sure many of you know, repeatedly points out that capitalism reproduces the religious mysticism and mystification we find in earlier stages of history, but in new forms such as commodity fetishism. So it's quite typical for Marx to employ religious metaphors when discussing capitalism. But Marx in his 1844 comments on James Mill says something more. After making his typical point that the essence of money is a kind of social practice rather than some property of a material thing such as gold, he then says that our social practice has become an independent uh, material thing, an actual entity, a real God that has real causal powers and that we are slaves to this God and its cult has become an end in itself. And I think we should make special note that Marx says a real God and not an imaginary one. So Marx is not talking about the mere ideological worship of say the idol of the free enterprise or the market but actual material subordination to an actually existing entity. So this is not merely commodity fetishism. This is more like a full blown Lovecraftian nightmare. So surely this is hyperbole. Marx's talk of commodity production manifesting or invoking an entity that is a real God with real powers must be poetic metaphor, which aims for dramatic impact rather than scientific precision. Now, I think we are strongly predisposed to interpret Marx metaphorically rather than literally here because our modern commercial, commercial culture is thoroughly secular and we live it every day. Economics, as we all believe, is fundamentally a profane, not a sacred endeavor. 
commercial activity aims for worldly success, not spiritual enlightenment. And that success depends ultimately on some mastery of the social and material world, which requires industry experimentation, application of reason and so on, not worship of or subordination to or faith in higher beings. Capitalism embraces scientific rationality and technological progress, and it's happily detached itself from earlier beliefs about all powerful gods. Uh, plus, many of us, I hope, are hard-nosed scientists, and so we should be immediately skeptical of claims about mysterious entities that exist outside man and above man. So this is the question I want to address today. Is Marx's real God really real? Is it an entity that actually exists, or is it mere metaphor which serves to illustrate or dramatize some properties of social reality? To what extent should we take Marx seriously? Are we really blindly worshipping an alien god that controls us? And to answer that question, I will revisit some core aspects of Marx's theory of economic value, but from a slightly different perspective, which is that of control theory. And by control theory, I mean the scientific and mathematical theory of control systems. And this new perspective will help us decide how to interpret Marx's talk of a real God. So we all know that parts of reality can represent or measure other parts of reality. So a ruler measures length, a thermometer measures temperature, etc. We created those measuring devices for a particular purpose, a definite purpose. But the meaning of money, what it, it might signify, represent, is less clear. Money appeared over 2,000 years ago, but what it may represent as a symbol still remains a subject of deep controversy. And to be clear by money, I don't mean actual coins or notes, but instead the numerical quantities we see stamped on coins or printed on notes or stored as bits in computers. To be really precise, I should say unit of account, but saying money is simpler as long as we're all clear about what we mean. Now, Marx tackles the meaning of money in his famously difficult opening chapters of the first volume of Capital. He notes that the exchange of commodities in the market implies there's something equal or equivalent about them. So for example, if I sell 20 yards of linen for 10 pounds, then spend my 10 pounds on a new coat, then indirectly 20 yards of linen have been made equal to one coat by the act of exchange. Now, if market prices were entirely random, there would be nothing more to say because this equivalence would be accidental. But although prices fluctuate, they're not random. They're a strong signal in the noise. Typically, you can't sell a pen and then buy a plane, and you can't work for a day and then spend your day's wages to buy a mansion. There are exceptions, but those exceptions prove the rule. So during any period of time, there are definite well-established market prices that determine the ratios in which commodities can exchange, that is, are equalized with each other. And all these exchanges are facilitated by, to use Marx's phrase, an alien mediator that we call money. Now, a quick uh, dip into any anthropological textbook would quickly reveal that humans can entertain the most diverse and extraordinary beliefs about how the world works and how we should conduct our everyday lives. What some cultures would consider normal, others would consider very strange and bizarre. And we rarely take an anthropological viewpoint on our own culture because it's hard to do. It requires stepping out of our conceptual framework and looking at the ordinary and accepted as unusual and questionable. So I just want to take a moment to note how absolutely fantastical commodity exchange actually is. And I think only the most dedicated occultists would dare claim that everything we see around us, all the things and activities in the world, despite all appearances, are really the same. That one kilogram of caviar is the same as 1,000 different people clicking on the same internet advert. Or clowning at a children's party is actually the same as 200 rounds of shotgun ammunition. Or that one month of computing time on a high-spec machine in the cloud is the same as one ton of potatoes. Only highly trained adepts could begin to see the truth of such counterintuitive and magical affinities. But uh, we see more than the truth of it. We openly and regularly achieve it. We manifest these magical affinities on a daily basis. We treat quantities of fish eggs, human attention, clowning performances, bullets, computing time potatoes, 
a bewildering array of other things as the same, because in the marketplace, they all may be exchanged for one another via the alien mediator we call money. And the magical traditions, they rather only meekly propose correspondences between planets, minerals, and human fate. Uh, but the magical operations of our modern commercial world, where everything, activity, and even future events are successfully reduced to comparable quantities of this substance we call money, overwhelmingly surpass in both scale and ambition the most deranged fantasies of the me medieval grimoires. Market exchange achieves a miraculous universal affinity between all things under the sun. And it's for these kinds of reasons that Marx writes of the mystery of commodities with its magic and necromancy. So market societies achieve a titanic conceptual abstraction. Every single thing that we swap between ourselves is stamped with a single quantitative property we call exchange value, but rather mysteriously no single person no single consciousness is responsible for maintaining that abstraction. So to speak, we have two economic mysteries, a ubiquitous social abstraction without any obvious content and an abstraction without an abstractor. And to decide whether Marx's real God is real or a metaphor, we need to dig deeper into the alien mediator that is money, what exchange value represents, and what, if anything, maintains the abstraction of exchange value? So let's begin with the first mystery, which is, you know, what is this abstraction exchange value? What do these money quantities actually denote? Now, Marx argues that exchange value refers to a special common property shared by all commodities, which is that of being products of labor. So caviar and clicks are the same because to manifest them as commodities in the marketplace requires a sacrifice of someone's labor. I think that Marx's argument for this proposition that the special common property shared by all commodities is labor isn't entirely satisfactory. I think the conclusion is correct, but his argument for it isn't. But I don't really want to take a detour into the whys and wherefores of that debate. So let's simply accept this at face value for now. Marx then says that the common property cannot be specific kinds of labor because fishing for caviar, writing advertising software, clowning, uh, making bullets are very different activities. So the act of exchange abstracts from all the individual peculiarities of different laboring activities, leaving something common to all of them, which Marx calls human labor in the abstract or abstract labor. Commodities, according to Marx, of economic value only because human labor in the abstract has been embodied or materialized in it, end quote. We have to be a little bit careful with the term embodied because Marx doesn't literally mean that abstract labor inheres within the material body of the commodity. Abstract labor is not a physical property of a thing. What he means is that some definite fraction of the total labor time of society must be used up or expended to produce the commodity and bring it to market. So abstract labor is not concrete labor, not a specific type of laboring activity, but something else, something deeper and more general. As Marx states, abstract labor has the character of the average labor power of society. So a good first approximation is to think of abstract labor as denoting the causal powers of the typical or average worker. That isn't quite right, but it will do for now. So the titanic abstraction achieved by commodity exchange refers to a specific content, which is a property of the material world that Marx calls abstract labor. Marx then immediately asks the obvious question. He asks, how then is the magnitude of this value to be measured? And he answers in a seemingly straightforward manner that it's measured by its duration and labor time in its turn finds its standard in weeks, days, and hours. So we're talking about units of time. We might think that, that we could immediately pull out our stopwatches and start measuring the amount of time people spend working and then correlate our measurements with the prices we observe in the market. 
because if prices really do represent labor time, then we should in principle be able to scientifically verify that claim. Uh, but that would be a bit hasty because before we can even consider empirically verifying Marx's theory of value, we need more clarity on what that theory actually is, what its, its structure is. Now, I'm not sure how deliberate this is because I meet, uh, you know, I read Marx in translation, but it might be noteworthy that Marx doesn't ask how should we measure quantities of abstract labor, and neither does he answer by saying that we can measure it by its duration. And that's because we don't measure abstract labor, something else measures it. And this property of Marx's theory that money refers to labor time in virtue of our collective social activity and independently of our thoughts about it is radically different from the classical political economy of his day and also modern economic theory. The abstraction is not ours because our cognition is not performing the abstraction. We are not the abstractor. Instead, the mysterious abstractor is taking the measurements about labor time and connecting the form of value, which is money, to its content, which is abstract labor. So as scientists, our first job isn't to start measuring labor time. Our first job is to understand what the abstractor is, how it connects its abstraction to its world. We need a theory of this abstracting entity and its powers before embarking on empirical verification. So, we have a partial answer to the first economic mystery. Exchange value represents abstract labor. So let's turn to the second mystery, who's doing the abstracting. In fact, Marx already told us who it is. Uh, he already told us who the mysterious abstractor is. And sometimes mysteries hide in plain sight. And the big clue is Marx's choice for the title for his magnum opus. The abstractor is what Marx calls capital. But the term capital can, can mislead us. First of all, it gets us thinking about large sums of money, a capital sum. But capital is more than that. And also, modern economic theory has reduced the term capital to a vanilla accounting term that mixes up, in a confused way, capital equipment with large sums of money. But capital for Marx is first and foremost a social practice. Capital denotes a collection of activities that certain people do regularly, embedded within a system of property rights, contracts, and coercive power. Capital is, is a circuit where initial capital sum is invested in production and then typically returns with a profit increment. Um, this circuit is mediated not only by money, but also economic production itself, including the disciplining and exploitation of workers. And Marx's standard language of capital, of social relations of production, circuits of accumulation, etc., doesn't fully evoke what's really going on. And I think that's why he sometimes turned to religious language. So instead of saying capital, I'm also going to say the controller, because capital is a control system, not merely in the political sense, but in the more profound and scientifically important sense of being a negative feedback control system. Capital is literally a controller. So if capital is a controller, then how does it work and what does it control? So scientific progress sometimes consists in organizing a whole range of diverse phenomena under a single principle. And the emergence of cybernetics in the early 20th century was just such kind of an, an event. And the core idea of cybernetics is that many different kinds of systems, uh, be they mechanical, physical, biological, cognitive, or social, they're types of control systems that exhibit a particular kind of causal structure, the negative feedback control loop. And it turns out that negative feedback control explains how parts of reality can control and therefore refer to other parts of reality in a completely materialistic and um, transparent way. So just take the mundane example of a thermostat uh, in your home. 
You set the system's goal by uh, fiddling with its temperature setting. The thermometer component of the system measures the room's temperature. The thermostat mechanically compares its setting to the measured temperature. If that temperature is too high, the thermostat emits a signal to turn the heating on, otherwise it turns the heating off. And in this way, the heating system controls the temperature of the room. And it will do so autonomously without you ever having to touch it again. And all negative feedback control loops have four main components, an internal goal state, a sensor that measures some property of its, its external world, a comparator that compares the sensor reading to the goal state, and an effect or action system that, which changes the world to move it closer to the goal state. And that is how it controls. The temperature of our bodies is controlled by a similar kind of biological feedback loop, except the control loop in this case isn't implemented upon metal wires and plastic, but upon nerves, enzymes, and, and sweat glands. In fact, all homeostatic and goal-directed systems conform to this basic causal template. And different examples just implement the components of the control loop in different ways. And <clears throat> perhaps surprisingly, there is a very significant control loop hiding in plain, plain sight, which affects every aspect of modern life in the most profound and intimate manner. So the basic unit of production where capital meets labor to produce goods and services is the capitalist firm. And every profit maximizing firm is owned by a private capital or capitals. Capitalists extract profits, but they can only spend a fraction of their profits on luxury consumption because if they spent all their profit on luxuries, their capital would rapidly diminish and expire. They're in competition with other capitals. Their profit income must be reinvested in order to make more profit. And this is the prime directive for anyone who possesses a capital sum of money. And owners of capital, capitalists, can't put all their eggs in one basket. That's too risky because firms can go under, assets might depreciate. So capitalists spread their risk by owning a portfolio of investments with different risk profiles. And a typical portfolio will consist of all kinds of different things like cash held in different sovereign currencies, bonds, government municipal or corporate bonds, shares of different companies from risky startups to blue chips, and all kinds of income producing assets such as land and housing. Basically anything that might yield a higher than average return. Each individual capital must aim to maximize the return over its portfolio. If it fails, it will diminish in size relative to other capitals and eventually cease being a capital at all. And it's right here that we again find the causal structure of a feedback control system. An individual capital, when we consider it as a social practice mediated by a privately owned large sum of money, also has its own goal state, sensory inputs, decision making, and ability to act upon the world in which it's embedded. So let's take each of those in turn. The goal of an individual capital is to maximize the average return from every dollar or pound invested, every unit of value. The sensory inputs are the different profit rates earned across the portfolio. The capitalists or the financial experts they employ compare the different profit rates. And the feedback loop is closed by actions that withdraw capital from poorly performing investments and inject capital into high performing investments. And this control loop manifests as an insatiable and ceaseless search for high returns. Capital doesn't, doesn't care how its money is actually used in production. It entirely abstracts from all concrete activities. The only thing it can sense, compare and use is abstract value. So at the commanding heights of the global economy, um, we find an enormous ensemble of individual capitals, each manically scrambling for profit, reacting to the signals of differential returns received from its tendrils that extend to every productive activity under its rule. 
continually injecting and withdrawing capital to and from different industrial sectors and geographical regions. The entirety of the world's resources, including the working time of billions of people, are repeatedly marshaled and remarshaled away from low and towards high profit activities. And in the space of months, entire industrial sectors may be raised up, relocated or thrown down. But what about the individuals who participate in this social practice? Surely their individual consciousness, their ideas and their behavior matter and make a difference. And to a certain extent, they do, of course. But individuals come and go. But capitals live much longer than any individual human. The people controlled by the capital, that is the workers that supply labor to firms and the capitalists that exploit them and extract the profits, are merely replaceable components of the control loop, mechanically performing prescribed social roles. Uh, for instance, uh, Marx writes in Capital that, uh, begin quote, to classical economy, the proletarian is but a machine for the production of surplus value. On the other hand, the capitalist is in its eyes only a machine for the conversion of this surplus value into additional capital, end quote. We often say that a capitalist possesses or owns capital, but it's more accurate to say that capital owns or possesses them. Capitals are the human face of this inhuman intelligence with its own logic and its own goals. In the Communist Manifesto, the, the point is made that in bourgeois society, capital is capital that's independent and has individuality, while the living person is dependent and has no individuality. So bigger capitals enjoy the advantage of larger portfolios, which spreads risk better. In consequence, capital tends to concentrate in a few hands. So we find a large number of small capitals and a very small number of astronomically large capitals, which earn profits that dwarf the GDP of many nation states. So the scale and power of some capitals is truly titanic. And these titans are so much in control that they are out of control. And again, here's another quote from the Communist Manifesto. Um, modern bourgeois society with its relations of production of exchange and of property, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells." End quote. In, myth in mythology, um, demons are anarchic out of control entities that cause us harm through tormenting us or through possession. And not only is the power of capital titanic, it's also demonic. And let's just briefly consider a few examples of the demonic power of capital. Every day, millions of people around the globe have no choice but to sacrifice their time, their vitality, to produce new profit for these autonomous controllers. No matter how hard or long or efficiently we work, the imperative to work remains. Why? Because every labor-saving technical innovation takes the form of profit, which is then captured by individual capitals and immediately re-injected into the material world to animate new activities for further profit. And that's why, despite huge advances in automation, the working day remains as long as ever. Take another example. The logic of capital demands maximum profit extraction from firms, and that means minimizing wages. Those possessed by capital live an exalted existence, existence, but the world's dispossessed must feed, clothe, and maintain a home with an average income of roughly about seven pounds a day. Take another example. It's better to be exploited by the demonic controllers than not so we're subject to the whims of the business cycle and periodic crises of accumulation. Recessions regularly throw large numbers of people out of work through no fault of their own. Suddenly bills can't be paid. Families are thrown onto the street as happened in the US during the 2008 mortgage crisis. And it's happening again 
now for slightly different reasons. Why? Because individual capitals are almost blind. Their sensory systems are limited. They see only differential returns across their portfolios. And these returns may be good, even great, even when unemployment is high or human misery spills out onto the streets. Capital doesn't care. Another example, capital deals only in abstract value and things that are not owned, which aren't bought and sold, therefore have no value at all. So the material wealth of nature, the land, the oceans, the atmosphere is relentlessly plundered without any regard for the consequences. Capital destroys us and the environment and the endless production and profit making cannot stop because each individual capital must compete to survive. And Marx uh, summarized the prime directive of capital as begin quote, it's a famous one, accumulate, accumulate, reconvert the greatest possible portion of surplus value into capital, accumulation for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake. By this formula, classical economy expressed the historical mission of the bourgeoisie, end quote. So all these autonomous control loops have the single-minded goal of extracting profit from the world's activities. If an activity fails to satisfy that goal, then the controller withdraws its capital and the activity stops. So we have a competing collection of identical controllers with a atavistic low level of intelligence, which inject and withdraw a social substance that appears to possess the magical power of animation, of bringing things alive, of creation. It also appears to possess the power of annihilation, of suffocation, of bringing things to an end and of destruction. We are definitely not in control and something else definitely is in control. So what are we really talking about now? We're saying that a new kind of supra individual control system emerged quite spontaneously from our own social intercourse and then in a very real sense has taken on a life of its own turned around and started controlling us capital in a scientific not a metaphorical sense is a control system and it is capital as a control system that ultimately creates and maintains this abstraction we call exchange value capital is that abstractor before we can fully explain how that happens, we need to take some moments to explore the relationship between control systems and primitive forms of cognition. So very earliest humans were at the mercy of nature. At any time the harvest might be ruined, illness or injury might strike. And the earliest theoretical framework to explain these capricious forces of nature uh, seems to be animism. And animism is the belief that all natural phenomena, such as the weather, geography, plants, trees, animals, um, are ultimately controlled by an autonomous living entity with human-like agency. So early humans believed that different clusters of empirical phenomena were controlled by conscious spirits with minds of their own. Marx gives us a very brief sketch of this sort of history of religion in part three of anti-during, which he begins with a discussion of animism. The weather gods, the sea gods, sun gods, moon gods, all these gods of illness and healing, all these are the hidden actors are ultimate cause of uncontrollable events. And if you believe gods are real and are invisible hands that affect your life, then it makes perfect sense to appeal to them by praying or giving them gifts building temples to worship them. And so the power and the majesty of the ancient, ancient gods was really the perverted expression of the powerlessness and misery of early humans. Now, today, we enjoy a great deal more control over our lives compared to our ancestors. And this material progress in itself has gradually removed the material basis for animistic belief systems. Many of the causal powers of the ancient, ancient gods and demons have one by one been explained by science. So they lost their power. Instead of a rag bag of pagan gods with special powers and domains, we have scientific fields with their own theories and technical terminology. 
animistic religion does persist in capitalist society, but typically well outside the mainstream. And as Marx explains in his short sketch, um, start quote, at the still further stage of evolution, all the natural and social attributes of the numerous gods are transferred to one almighty God, who is but a reflection of the abstract man, end quote. So modern monotheistic religions, um, Islam, Christianity, and so on, talk of one all-encompassing God who is remote and abstract, and unlike the animistic deities of old, typically doesn't interfere in everyday phenomena, in day-to-day -day life. Marx, in his sketch, then turns to modern society and makes the important point that capitalism doesn't abolish the material conditions that give rise to religious beliefs. Uh, here's the quote on the slide. In existing bourgeois society, men are dominated by the economic conditions created by themselves, as if by an alien force. The actual basis of the religious reflective activity therefore continues to exist. It is still true that man proposes and God, that is the alien domination of the capitalist mode of production, disposes." End quote. Precisely because capitalism is in control and not people, then the actual basis of religious reflection continues to exist. And famously in the first chapter of Capital, Marx explains how market exchange uh, generates a kind of religious mystification, which he calls commodity fetishism, which is the illusion that economic value is a natural or material property of commodities. So inanimate objects, especially forms of gold, such as forms of money, sorry, such as gold, fetishistically appear to have special powers in, in and of themselves. But Marx talk here of a God that we propose to, and it disposes, takes us beyond commodity fetishism. Marx is pointing to the fact that economic laws have godlike powers, operate independently of us, and control and dominate us like forces of nature. So is Marx therefore committing an animistic fallacy by suggesting that capital as an independent entity is a real God with real powers with a mind of its own? But once we understand capital to be an autonomous control system, then the answer I think is a plain no. A control loop has all the basic elements of cognition. It in fact has primitive analogues of sensing, deciding, and acting. And so a qualified kind of animism is entirely appropriate here. And of course, the sensing, thinking and acting cycle of an individual capital is quite unlike that of an individual human being. But nonetheless, both pursue distinct goals and both have the power to control the environment they are embedded within. One control system consists of neurons, muscles, and organs, while the other consists of social practices, belief systems, and the exchange of a value substance. So speaking animistically, a spirit or a deity indeed controls capitalism. This particular God can shatter itself and appear at multiple times in multiple places. And it can combine with versions of itself to aggregate into bigger, and more powerful incarnations. It can possess humans and control them by forcing them to work or forcing them to accumulate. And this entity directs social activity by giving and withdrawing its magical substance, which we call value. We sacrifice ourselves to it, we appease it, and we hope it will favor us. All these statements are scientifically accurate. They're not metaphors. And I think adopting a more animistic theory of modern capitalism would counterintuitively constitute scientific progress of a kind. So let's now take this animistic point of view and inquire what capital as a godlike entity tends to think about. What are the contents of capital's cognition? So sometimes it's obvious what a particular control system controls because we designed it. So we know that a thermostat controls room temperature um, 
and in consequence, the electrical control signals that flow within the thermostat and the heat and heating system refer to temperature. But the vast majority of control systems are not designed by people. Nature is stuffed full of them from simple homeostatic mechanisms to incredibly complex um, animal brains. These systems evolved without a designer and therefore we have to work harder to, to determine what they control and what their internal representations may or may not re represent in their environment. For reasons of time, I can't get into the scientific theory that determines what controllers in fact control. And it's not a simple story. And I think the complexity of that story partially explains why Marx's argument that abstract labor is the substance of value in the opening chapters of Capital those chapters that he famously worked and reworked, that Engels joked bore the marks of his painful carbuncles. The reason why that part of the argument is not entirely satisfactory is because Marx, I think, had stumbled upon a hard problem that couldn't be fully solved with the conceptual tools available to him. But I don't have time to go down into this interesting rabbit hole of objective semantics. So instead I'll jump to the conclusion and simply state what capital as a control system in fact controls. We already know that capitals, both big and small, are intimately connected to the process of production. The capitalist firm borrows capital to buy inputs and means of production and to hire workers. Workers supply concrete labor to produce use values for sale in the market. That's all very clear. Now, the controller, judges all the different concrete activities across its portfolio in the same way, which activities yield above average returns and which don't. The controller rewards firms that make comparatively high profits with new injections of investment, but punishes firms that make comparatively low profits or losses by withdrawing its capital. And these monetary rewards and punishments flow down through firms into the labor market and reward concrete labor by the payment of wages or punish by withdrawal and unemployment. And in this very real sense, capital wants specific kinds of concrete activities and doesn't want other kinds. And the kinds of activities it wants are those that yield above average profit. Capital is therefore controlling us and it controls how we spend our time. So capital wants laboring activities that yield profit and simplifying and following Marx, we can identify two essential properties that concrete labor must possess in order to yield profit. First, it has to be useful to others and that is produce commodities that can be sold in the market. So no one will buy a coat with three arms. Second, it must have above average efficiency. In other words, a firm makes more profit if it uses up less labor time than competitors that produce the same commodity. And this is why just after Marx first introduces the concept of abstract labor in the first volume of Capital in the first chapter, he immediately points out that only socially necessary and useful labor counts as abstract labor. Capital doesn't want workers to spend time smelling the roses with their family and friends because that activity doesn't yield saleable use values. Neither does capital want workers to slack on the job or become ill because slacking an illness isn't efficient. Capital, if it completely had its way with us, would have us spend all our time laboring in a firm at the highest possible intensity, continually striving to outcompete other workers in the labor market. That's the kind of behavior that capital as a controller wants. So capital controls concrete labor, the real laboring activities of the working population in all their diverse manifestations. And capital controls actual labor, labor time, actual clock times of real people doing real things. So it's capital itself that holds the metaphorical stopwatch in its hand, measuring and accounting and judging and condemning, always on the lookout for the slightest slacking off or insubordination. And the goal of capital is to convert concrete labor into abstract labor into the kind of labor that both fits into a division of labor, so it can be exchanged against other labor and equalized with it, 
and into the kind of labor that fully sacrifices itself to capital, gives itself up as tribute in order to yield profits to the capitalist firm, and ultimately the controlling dominant capitals that stand behind them. In other words, abstract labor is manifested, brought into reality by capital itself. Maximizing profit is identically the process of maximizing the manifestation of abstract labor out of, from, concrete labor. And it's for these kinds of reasons that Marx says that only abstract labor creates value. Concrete labor may or may not create value. If it doesn't, it isn't abstract labor and capital as a controller quickly works to eradicate its existence by withdrawing capital from the firms that employ it. So capital is a controller that employs a form of value money to control the content of value, which is labor time. And the form and the content are bound together, linked semantically in the relation of representation to referent by the lawful regularities instantiated by generalized commodity production. And as we've seen, control systems instantiate the basic elements of cognition. They in fact have internal representations that refer to the world they act in. And in consequence, Marx's theory of value can be thought of fundamentally as a theory of an alien cognition that controls us. And it's no wonder then that he wrote of the necromancy of commodity production because only religious, magical and occult traditions in our history have adequate concepts to express this predicament. And this predicament in itself is simply an evolution of our previous bondage to religious and um, mystical uh, belief systems. So the occult concept of an egregore is quite useful here. An egregore is a non-physical entity that exists in virtue of the collective ritual activities of a group, yet operates autonomously according to its own internal logic to materially influence and control the group's activities. The group creates the egregore and the egregore then creates the group in a self reinforcing feedback loop. And Marx in the quote on the slide explicitly calls out this reciprocal relationship between a God and its people or between a cult and its egregore. Now, the ritual activities of the initial capitalist cults were so materially successful, they rapidly metastasize and, and in a few centuries engulf the whole world. And what is universal becomes the unnoticed background. So the egregore in our society is hard to see, but it, it hides in plain sight. We do refer to it, of course, but obliquely using um, soporific names such as the economy or the markets or capital. But Marx pointed to a, a better name for it, one designed to wake us from our slumber, a real God with real powers. So capital, I think, is an egregore, not metaphorically or ironically, but actually. Uh, capital is a being, an autonomous entity with primitive thoughts about us. Money is how it measures us and money is how it commands us. Capital is the alien cognition that acts in the world to bind the form of value to its content. So now we know what the abstractor is and now we have a clearer grasp of the core structure of Marx's theory of value. It becomes easier to spot certain misinterpretations of it. I just want to spend a few moments um, laying out the landscape of those misinterpretations. Some misinterpretations emphasize the content at the expense of the form. Marx's theory is not at all like the naive materialism we find in classical political economy or in modern um, Sraffian interpretations of Marx, which posit one-way causation from concrete labor time to, uh, to the value form, to money prices. Instead, we have to think about feedback loops, about two-way causation from content to form and from form back to content. But perhaps more insidiously, there are other misinterpret misinterpretations that emphasize the form at the expense of the content. Now, clearly, Marx's theory is an objective theory of value. And despite the pretensions of subjective utility theories, we can't collectively wish planes to be cheaper than pens. We are not the dominant controller, we are the controlled. 
the individual consumer is not king, but more sophisticated variants of idealism appear in Marxist interpretations. Some Marxists think capital, in a sense, dreams about abstract labor. The abstract labor is an invention of the capitalist system, which doesn't actually refer to something existing independently in objective reality. And this reduces Marx theory to a postmodern parody of ghostly and ideal forms. And in this misinterpretation, the form has no content. And so money doesn't refer to any property that exists independently of it. The form creates an illusory content. In this view, abstract labor may have real effects in the way that belief in Father Christmas may cause people to offer cookies and milk, but it doesn't really exist. It may seem sophisticated, but ultimately it reduces to value nihilism, where there are only prices and there's nothing hidden behind them. But Marx's theory is essentially about the control of concrete labor time, the actual objective working conditions of millions of people. So any interpretation of Marx that claims that abstract labor can't be measured independently of markets and prices, or can't provide a definition of the content of value without relying on um, special coefficients that depend on prices has gone fundamentally awry. But like any entity, capital's thoughts may not perfectly re reflect or fully represent the reality in which it's embedded. But if a control system successfully controls, then its internal representations do bear a truthful correspondence to reality. And capital is a supremely successful controller. And this is why ultimately why Marx's value claims can be empirically verified with our stopwatches, as I mentioned earlier. Labor is already disciplined to be efficient and useful. And so the majority of concrete labor is already abstract labor. So if we pick a group of say 50 workers randomly, they will approximate the value producing power of 50 units of abstract labor. And if we take larger aggregates, then that approximation improves. Taking out our stopwatch doesn't work at the level of an individual worker because there's no guarantee their concrete labor will ultimately count as abstract labor. But our stopwatch will measure abstract labor if we collect sufficient samples. As Marx stated, um, abstract labor, sorry, my uh, phone has gone off. Let me just um, stop that, sorry. Um, As Marx said, abstract labor has the character of the average labor power in society. So the control success of capitalism means that we can measure quantities of abstract labor before that labor is equalized and homogenized in the market. And this is such an important point um, and so subtle that I'm, I'll try an, an analogy which might help. So if we think of an ethologist studying the behavior of an animal in the wild, the ethologist can't truly get inside the animal's head and see the world through its eyes. The ethologist can never fully know what it's like to be a bat. None, nevertheless, ethologists have developed detailed theories of echolocation and how a bat's cognition represents its environment. In a similar way, we are studying the behavior of an autonomous entity called capital with an alien cognition. Abstract labor is its con concept, not ours but we can form a concept of abstract labor that corresponds to its concept of abstract labor. Because after all, we, the controlled and it, the controller, all live in the same world. And we can talk about and represent a shared objective property of the world. And what is that objective property? So now I feel that we can return and refine our initial approximate definition of abstract labor. It's not just average labor or the common causal powers of human labor. It's something more specific, something more historically determined by capital and therefore contingent. Abstract labor is a collection of the causal powers possessed by human labor that can manifest as a, an ability to produce an endless variety of useful things for others, to make profits by working harder or longer or to improve techniques of production so more may be produced with less, and to outcompete others in a ceaseless scramble for profit. If we workers objectively lacked these causal powers, then capital would fail 
to mold us into the value creating homogenous units that it wants. Okay, so let me draw to a close and try to sum up. Uh, and try and summarize what I've been trying to say um, for the last hour. Um, capital isn't a huge sum of money. It's a definite set of social practices that instantiate a control system. Each capital is a controller that acts independently of any individual human consciousness. In its very real sense, each capital is an entity, a being for itself. And each capital has primitive forms of cognition. Capitals continually sense, decide and act in order to achieve this overriding goal of maximizing returns. This is not a metaphor, but science. Marx's real God is really real. Marx reminds us that capitalism doesn't abolish the material conditions that give rise to magical and religious thinking. Commodity fetishism is rife and confusions abound. For example, modern economic science has successfully repressed Marx's theory of value and the theft-based nature of capitalist property relations, yet has proved itself incapable of formulating an alternative theory of economic value. Those economic mysteries remain. And that, to add to the confusion and mystification, capitalist ideology promotes the idea that our commercial culture is fundamentally a rational and secular endeavor. But the opposite is the case. The rationality of capitalism is not human, but alien, and we don't control it, but it controls us. Capitalist ideology refuses to see the real God that is capital and our subordination to it. The God is real, but hidden, hiding in plain sight. And in this sense, capitalism is an occult, not a secular mode of production. Uh, the value form, the titanic abstraction that permeates every aspect of our lives is in a sense, the primitive language of the controller. It sees and judges our activities in terms of abstract value by comparing profit rates. But it also commands our activities using abstract value by injecting and withdrawing its substantial being which is money. Capital works to mold, shape, and discipline the total labor power of society into the specific form of abstract labor, which is labor that gives itself up utterly and completely as tribute to capital. So the value form participates in both measuring labor time, but also commanding labor time. And we shouldn't be surprised that the value form has imperative semantics also. Generalized commodity exchange has no conscious planner or plan, and therefore the command and control necessary to organize the division of labor is achieved through the allocation of capital, the transmission of money and the structure of market prices. Capital commands concrete labor time to manifest as abstract labor time and therefore brings into being what is already latent uh, within us. But capital intensifies and perfects only a part of us. We are more than merely creatures able to manifest abstract labor. We have the power to do much more than merely produce useful things by working intensely. So despite capital's rule, we obviously resist and find places and moments where we can be more fully ourselves. But capital doesn't want this. It doesn't want us to play, to learn, explore, care, or give freely. Capital wants us to produce endlessly. And therefore we, under the rule of capital, are reduced to shadows, mere narrow abstractions of what we could be. We are the abstracted and it is the abstractor. So let me finish, I think, hopefully on time with a very blunt analogy. Cows, think of cows. Cows can do lots of things, but all we care about is that they produce as much milk and meat as possible. And so we breed them, inject them, rear them and control them to do only that. And sometimes their udders are so distended by excessive production that they tear, split and spill. And we are cattle to capital we too have become disfigured and distorted by its rule. It brands us as abstract labor, but we are also concrete individuals. The form doesn't exhaust the content. And this seemingly innocuous non-identity between form and content is the fundamental reason why one day we will escape from capital's demonic rule. So um, let me stop there. Um, thank you for listening. And I look forward to the discussion.